So welcome, good morning, evening, afternoon, depending on where you guys are, to the Haifa Academy webinar. Um, we are proud to host Professor Patrick Brown. Um, and the topic today is of advances in almond nutrition. All right. Um, Dr. Patrick Brown is a distinguished professor at the University of California, Davis, Department of Plant Science in Davis, California. Um, he got his bachelor's degree with first honors at the University of Aladdin, Aladdin Australia. Adelaide. Adelaide, yep. Yeah. Uh, PhD from Cornell University, the essentiality of nickel for higher plants, agronomy, and international agriculture development in 1988. Uh, some of the, his topics of study are mineral nutrition with a focus on perennials, potassium, nitrogen, zinc, nickel, and boron. Other research interests include coffee biology, biostimulants, mineral nutri nutrient transport, management of nitrogen in horticultural crops, growers, adoption practices, yield prediction and patterns of yield variation, precision agricultural, salinity, organic matter management, remote sensing, irrigation uh, scheduling, extension methodology and fertigation. Dr. Brown has published 200 plus journal articles, books and chapters and more than 400 extension and grower focused publications. Dr. Brown has served as chair of 19 PhDs and 42 master's students and is very active in the undergraduate teaching. Dr. Brown is an associate editor for numerous leading journals and has been active in the major commodity boards for California tree crops and served on numerous governmental advisory panels. Some of his uh, recent awards in 2017, he got the USDA Extension Research and Education Award and then from the American Society of Plant Biology, the Dennis Hogland Award for Outstanding Plant Research in Support of Agriculture. And then from the American Society of Agronomy, the Social uh, Soil Science and Crop Science, Leo M. Walsh, Soil Fertility Designated Lecturer. And also he has become the University of California uh, or Distinguished Professor and many, many other awards. And Dr. Brown, take it over. Thank you very much. And if everybody could mute their microphones, that would be excellent. So what I want to talk about today um, <clears throat> in the one hour uh, that we have uh, is advanced nutrition of almond. Now, I was given some instructions from my Haifa hosts about what to speak about. Um, so I have attempted to squeeze as much of it in as I could. Um, <clears throat> I tend not to get into very specific details about rates of fertilizer and the rest. I like rather to talk about the principles that underline the decision-making processes. Uh, we will get a chance towards the end of this to also touch upon uh, biostimulants and how they interact. Now, all plants share the same requirement for essential elements. So the 17 essential elements are listed here, the 14 essential mineral elements are listed. But in my experience with almond and, and looking at almond production around the world, it's very clear that almond has some elements, such as those shown in red here, that you must always take an active management strategy towards. Uh, other elements, the ones in yellow, uh, it's very critical to monitor and manage in response to the presence of a, of a challenge, but it's not necessary to think about them every year all the time, depending upon your environment. The ones in green, magnesium, sulfur, iron, copper, these are sporadic. These are soil chemistry driven, soil type driven challenges, um, not commonly seen in California, but of course we have the privilege of some pretty uh, excellent soils in most of our almond growing region, but certainly we see iron deficiency in some of the Mediterranean regions in Australia in the highly alkaline soils. And then there's a host of elements for which we have no information listed here. What I'm going to do first is focus on nitrogen and on potassium. Now, one thing that has changed in recent years, at least in California, and I apologize, I hope I don't go over Calif overly Californian in my perspective, but that's where I have the most experience, is that we've moved away from managing nitrogen by utilizing tissue samples and moved much more towards managing nitrogen through a nutrient budget approach. 
Uh, and in some regards, this has been forced upon us by environmental considerations, but also by commercial considerations. Many of the major buyers of almonds in California are demanding sustainability credentials from our industry. But we manage nitrogen and potassium now by thinking much more about this equation that we should be supplying to meet demand as close as possible. Uh, and that's essential in the case of nitrogen because excess nitrogen is a pollutant. It's also essential, of course, in the case of nitrogen and potassium because they're expensive inputs and they should be optimized. So we think about the supply side of the equation, cover crops, manures, irrigation water. In California, there's a lot of nitrogen in some of the irrigation waters as a consequence of over fertilization. And then of course, commercial applications of fertilizers. We are seeing increasing uh, emphasis and interest in cover crops, manures, and composts. And this is being enabled as California starts to move towards an off-ground harvest system that allows the nuts to not hit the ground of the, of the orchard, which allows us to manage nutrients on the soil floor, composts and manures on the soil floor more actively. Critically important in all of this is how to prevent loss from the system how to minimize fixation of potassium in the system by management of the soil, management of the irrigation systems, the fertigation systems. We'll talk about that in some detail. Now, as I mentioned, oops, the context for nitrogen, the context for our movement towards this budgeting approach is derived from widespread problems with nitrogen pollution in the main uh, growing regions of the Californian almond industry. A lot of soil contamination, groundwater contamination has occurred. And as a consequence, California now has the most highly regulated nitrogen management system in the United States and getting close to it in the world. Now, our European colleagues will, will also be aware of some of this. Nitrogen management in the European context is important as well. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, it's going to become important for most almond producers because we are seeing major commercial purchases of almond in Europe, in Japan, demanding that we have good sustainability systems in place. And that's going to become a global trend. Just to give you a quick highlight not that it's relevant for everybody, but because it provides the context, in California, Nitrogen recommendations can only be made by certified advisors who've gone through a training program or a grower who's passed a written exam. <clears throat> every grower, every field must keep records of application, records of nitrogen in irrigation water, records of nitrogen in the soil, and then at the end of the year, records of nitrogen offtake in harvested crop. A balance sheet is produced if there is uh, poor performance, individuals can be held accountable with the regulatory processes. Now, why this is relevant in a broader context is because it's encouraged in California a new thinking, a new thinking where we integrate our irrigation method decisions with our demand for water, with our fertilizer management strategies, testing strategies to derive this budget. To achieve all of that, California has increasingly started to think about and started to adopt the four R's practices that the International Plant Nutrition Institute has been um, advertising and, and, and um, encouraging through all cropping systems globally, but certainly in the US and in Europe. The four R process considers application of the right rate, application at the right time, application in the right place, using the right soil. Now, while this was developed primarily to address the issues of excess nitrogen loss from agricultural systems, what I've found is, as we talk about this process with growers, talk about this process with uh, crop consultants, commercial fertilizer salesmen, is that it emphasizes the systematic approach to fertilization strategies. And I think this has been a good thing. Uh, previously, historically in California and in much of the world, nitrogen or fertilizers were typically managed by taking leaf samples, seeing what the status is and making a decision subsequently. 
that's an inadequate approach. That is not sufficiently uh, sophisticated, not sufficiently precise to manage these major inputs effectively. What it's also done is help growers think about all the pieces of the system that contribute to nutrient use efficiency. So right rate is matching supply and demand. So it, it, it requires not only an estimate of demand, but an, also an estimate of all of the inputs, the water, the soil nitrogen, and the fertilizer nitrogen. Right timing is about when during the system season that that occurs. And we're gonna focus firstly on these two. Now, how do you derive these? Well, these are not trivial to derive in systems like perennial trees. We derived these from some extremely large experiments. And obviously the details are not important here. I put this just to illustrate, this is a five, seven year experiment over large acreages with big replicated trials in a very high product, highly productive orchard. Five-year trial, this was a 160-acre plot. We did this in several different plots. Uh, we had drip treatments and fan jet treatments. We had multiple rates and uh, sources of nitrogen. We, we monitored almost 100 trees in every single one of these treatments for all of their nitrogen and the nutrient use parameters. So a very large trial. The historic approach to determining how much nutrient and a, a crop demands and when during the year that crop takes that nutrient from the soil is by doing sequential harvests. Now, when you're doing something like a lettuce crop or tomato crop, it's pretty easy. You wander out there, you pull, pull a few heads of lettuce, you measure the nutrient content and you repeat. When doing that in trees, you can imagine the challenge. It requires whole tree excavations. It requires whole tree excavations with enough replication across enough treatments and enough time points to generate your data. This doesn't happen often because there's very few growers who would allow you to take 100 trees out of their orchard and grind them up into their pieces. But we had wonderful collaborators who allowed us to do this. And I'm going to show you various versions of this graph to illustrate how nutrients are allocated to trees during the year. We did this pre-selecting 200 trees in a mature orchard, treated with four different nitrogen rates. We then did whole tree excavations. So that is six trees taken out from each of those different rates at three times a year over a two year period. We then on a, another subset of trees, took out 25% of the tree of biomass, that is roots and major branches and allocated and, and analyzed them for their nutrient content. We then went through a coring process, taking subsamples of a host of trees. And from that, you can generate this kind of data. So this kind of data shows nutrient concentrations or contents, I should say, in the different organs of the tree roots, the trunks, the scaffold, canopy branches, small branches, leaves, blossoms, and fruit. You can follow that pattern of nutrient accumulation and nutrient depletion in different tissues to get you an analysis of when and where and how much nutrient is demanded by the almond tree. I'm going to show you nitrogen first, potassium subsequently. We've got this data for all of the nutrients in the tree. I don't have time to discuss this today. Before I get into what these patterns tell us, I want to show you some important information that came from different rates of nitrogen application. So you have four panels here, the 125, the 200, the 275, and the 350 nitrogen application, whether it's pounds per acre or, or kilograms per hectare, it's essentially the same. This is only looking at the perennial tissues. So I don't have here showing leaves or blossoms. And what I want to illustrate here is how the tree provides nutrients for the early seasonal growth and how those nutrients are replaced. Nitrogen is replaced as, as the plant matures. So let's first look at, sorry, just one second. Okay. So I show you here 
the green arrows. What the green arrows represent is the amount of nitrogen in this orchard. This is the total perennial content in a 12 year old tree from the beginning of the tree year to the end of the first year. So this is January in California, December in California. At the 125 pound rate, the tree accumulates 18 pounds of nitrogen. So even though quite deficient, it is still growing, it is still accumulating some nitrogen. In the second year, 25. When you increase that nitrogen to the 200 rate, the tree gains 35 and 35 in the second year. You increase it to the 275 pound rate, again, 35, 28, and in the very extreme, 50. So the total demand of nitrogen to grow the wood of the tree averages at about 35 pounds of nitrogen. This second arrow is important also. So what we do here is a methodology developed by Stephen Weinbaum, my predecessor, Peter Millard in the UK, Eric Nielsen in Canada, uh, and Isaac Klein from Volcani, where what you chant at the beginning of the year and then analyze the nutrient content in the wood at the lowest time during the year. This illustrates how much nitrogen from stored wood provides nitrogen to the developing annual tissues. And there's some important uh, effects here. So nitrogen deficient tree still contributes 15 pounds from storage to the uh, use of the tree. When you get into the nitrogen adequate tree in this particular field, 275 pounds resulted in optimal yield, optimal tissue value and minimal leaching. Here, 25 pounds is allocated from storage into the growth requirement. This graph sort of integrates the most important data from the previous graphs. And I'm happy to share any of these slides with anybody who wishes. But what I've done here is just illustrate the nitrogen content in all of the perennial tissues. So I've just made this simplified. And then the nitrogen content in the annual tissues. And we're going to trace that across the year from dormancy through to flowering, fruit set, harvest. <clears throat> First important principle. From January, December, that is, through to the lowest content of perennial tissue, that difference is about 30 pounds. So 30 pounds of nitrogen is used from storage to provide for flowering and early leaf and fruit growth. Notice there is no increase in nutrient content of those trees all the way through to mid-March when leaves are about 70% expanded. There is no uptake of nitrogen from the soil occurring at this period. Now, the old fashioned approach in California of putting a lot of nitrogen on the soil in the late fall and the early spring, January, meant you were putting a lot of nitrogen on the soil when the trees weren't using it. This also illustrates, of course, how important it is to make sure your trees are robust in their nitrogen supply. Once this stored nitrogen has been uh, utilized, then uptake occurs. And uptake occurs directly proportional to the, the, the number and the growth rate of the fruit on the tree. In this particular case, now this was very high yielding trees, 3,800 pounds, almost five ton, 260 pounds of nitrogen is present in the fruit. That 260 pounds is going to be removed from the orchard when you take that fruit away. As you move post-harvest, Nitrogen, of course, is assimilated from leaf senescence back into the perennial tissues. This is the nitrogen store that will be used in the subsequent year. The total nitrogen gain from the beginning of the year to the end of the year is 35 pounds. The message take home from dormancy to mid leaf out, there's very little nitrogen uptake. Nitrogen uptake from the soil occurs once leaves are present, once leaves are transpiring. It's essentially complete by hull split. So in this period, subsequent uptake is quite small. So from a fully mature fruit in August in California through to the end of the year, maybe only five to 10 pounds of additional nitrogen uptake. 
You can use this information and estimate what the offtake of nitrogen from the orchard is in each year and what the demand for growth is. You can also use it to generate an ideal fertilization strategy. The ideal fertilization strategy indicated by these blue dots would be to fertilize in direct proportion to the uptake patterns and direct proportion to the yield. So it's a demand driven fertilization strategy that has the consequence of optimizing the efficiency of nitrogen use and importantly, providing nitrogen not only for the growth of the plant, but for this critical period when next year's reserves of nitrogen and next year's flowering and fruiting points are derived. Now, while that makes perfect sense, the reality in California, even as we have moved growers towards thinking about multiple in-season fertigations, and I apologize to my Australian, Israeli, and Spanish uh, listeners, because in the U.S., we're not as sophisticated as you are. And I apologize for my U.S. listeners now as well. Um, this on-demand fertigation strategy is, is, is new in the U.S. Now, even in U.S. and Australia where this is done and where growers have started to adopt it, there is still a tendency for fertilization to be front-loaded. So we see this often where growers put more nitrogen on in the beginning of the year, as illustrated by these red dots, and then cut nitrogen during the fruit ripening period. That's predominantly done on the premise that it's necessary to control hull rot, so fungal diseases in the canopy. There are two problems with this approach. The first, of course, is the obvious one, is that if you're applying nitrogen well in excess of demand, you have the potential for nitrogen leaching, particularly if you have four or five or a dozen irrigation events occurring in this interim. The other constraint, the other problem with this is you can generate excess vigor with this excess, excess nitrogen application. And that excess vigor sets you up for more hull rot potential. The other constraint is the principle for this early front loading is to minimize excess nitrogen during fruit ripening. If you succeed in that, then you will also succeed in minimizing the availability of nitrogen for the bud formation processes in here. And I'm going to illustrate that in a minute where, where this becomes a constraint for subsequent years fertilization. Now, as I said, the reason this is done is hull rot. So hull rot is a major problem. I know in the US, it's also a problem in, uh, in California, I mean, in Australia. And there is clearly a nitrogen relationship. So here is a, a very high incidence hull rot year. As you go from 2.2% just adequate nitrogen to abundant nitrogen, your hull rot rate goes from 15 to 30%. It occurs because of excess nitrogen in the hull, makes it a favorable environment for the fungus. Excess nitrogen increases humidity in the canopy, making it a favorable environment for the fungus. Excess nitrogen delays the ripening process, making it a favorable environment for the, for the fungus. That's why it's done. The reality is you can actually optimize and minimize hull rot by going back to a tightly constrained nitrogen management fact that keeps nitrogen application through the whole year. And I like to recognize this as, you know, we overfeed our youngsters, we overfeed our young uh, orchard or our orchard in the beginning of the year, you're going to end up with a, with a grown up that is susceptible to disease. The same is true. What we rather want to do is a lean and mean fertilization strategy but make sure, of course, all demands are met. It also overcomes the potential for our, in, uh, our, our inadvertent disruption of the bud initiation process. I would emphasize, of course, you know, uh, all almond growers will take their orchard through a dry down period to help with hull split and to help with removal of the fruit from the tree.
increasingly it's becoming aware that that dry down period, that heavy dry down pre-harvest compromises next year's buds. So this is a, 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 an aspect of nutrient management in almond that we really need to think about in more detail. I see some people are asking questions. We will get questions at the end of this talk. All right. If we accept the premise that nitrogen is demand driven, that is the yield potential of the crop determines how much fertilization, you then obviously have an issue. Fields will be variable. This particular case in 160 acres in Almond in California, portions of the field running 4,000 pounds, portions of the field running 2,600 pounds. If you fertilize to meet the 4,000 pound demand, you will be applying 100 pounds more nitrogen than the other portions of the field require. In the Californian context, where we're under tremendous pressure to minimize nitrogen loss from the environment, this is a challenge that can really only be addressed by more precision management or alternatively identifying why this portion of the field is underperforming. Obviously, cultivars differ in their productivity and their, and their demand for nitrogen in any particular year. So this is alternate Monterey nonpareil, and you've got very clear differences in productivity and a demand, therefore, for more precision fertilization, more site-specific, cultivar-specific. As I said, this is very uncommon to go precision out irrigation in California, much more abundant, of course, in Australia, in, in, in Israel, and in Portugal and Spain, Spain in the fertigated, irrigated systems. This is something we need to do. All right. Nitrogen doesn't act by itself. And optimization of the use of nitrogen or potassium for that matter requires optimization of all of the other elements and all of the other practices. I put this up, to illustrate two particular points. This is our large field trial. Each one of these dots replicate, re represents 12 trees in a single sample. We have differential fertilizer rates, the red, the green, the blue, and the dark green. We have differential response in leaf tissue nitrogen and differential response in yield. Now, this is one of the most detailed experiments on nitrogen response that has ever been conducted. And what you should immediately see is that once these trees exceed 2.4% nitrogen, maybe even 2.3% nitrogen, there is no relationship between fertilization rate and yield. In fact, there's no relationship between fertilization rate and tissue rate, tissue nitrogen concentration, illustrating that leaf tissue analysis is an inadequate approach to make management decisions, but also illustrating <clears throat> that in this particular field, we have 70% of all trees with more than 2.3, 2.4% nitrogen, perfectly adequate nitrogen, and yet huge yield variability. Trees with 2.5% nitrogen yielding a thousand pounds less than trees, other trees with 2.5. So clearly we cannot make any management optimization unless we manage everything. And it brings us all the way back to Justice von Liebig's famous bucket, which I'm sure you've all seen a thousand times, that just illustrates that the response to any particular element will always be constrained by the availability of the other elements or the other management strategies. In that particular case of that field that I showed you, um, the problem was zinc deficiency. You know, half of the field was underperforming because of zinc deficiency. You can enhance nitrogen use efficiency by solving zinc deficiency. And I put this, and we'll talk about zinc in a moment in, in some more details. <clears throat> so uniformity, Correction of all the issues is ultimately the key. As I mentioned before, we've historically used leaf tissue sampling as our guideline for making decisions on most of our nutrients, but particularly potassium and nitrogen. And I'd argue that's old fashioned, can't be done. Leaf tissue sampling is little better than taking your blood pressure at the doctor. Eh, it tells you kind of how healthy you are, but it certainly doesn't tell you what to do about it if you're not healthy. It simply tells you there may be an issue. 
And one of the big issues is field variability. So this is 160 acre, in this case, it's actually pistachio, differential yield productivity and differential potassium values from 0.9 all the way to 2.2. If you think about this reality and you go out and you take leaf samples across the entire field, which nobody does, at best, you would get the average value of the field and the average value of the field would say you're 1.7. In pistachio, 1.7 is enough. So you may conclude this field is just fine because the average value meets the critical value. That's not correct. If the average value is the same as the critical value, then by definition, half the field is deficient. So when we realize growers typically target 2.2 or 2.4 as their potassium, what they're actually doing is attempting to feed the hungriest parts of the tree a field and as a consequence, overfeeding the rest. That's a challenge and it's got to be recognized that this is occurring in all of your fields. Now, in many cases, the solution or the, the, the resolution that growers have come to is, well, I will just feed to satisfy the hungriest portion of the field. And that's natural behavior. You go out in the field, you look over your field, you see a portion of the field is yellow, you increase the fertilizer to meet, make the entire field green. That's expensive for potassium, that's polluting for nitrogen. Now, there are things you can do to manage variability if you don't have the site-specific specific, uh, capability. Realistically, for low-cost inputs that can be flown on or driven on or sprayed on along with your, your fungicides or anything else, you can just go ahead and do it. You spray the whole field and manage it as is. Boron, zinc, calcium, manganese. Nitrogen, potassium require much better and much more resolved and refined management practices. You've got to think about the specificity because a blanket nitrogen application to feed the hungriest portion of the field is going to resolve in result in nitrogen leaching. Potassium's expensive. A blanket application to feed the hungriest portion is going to cost you money. So moving towards um, precision agriculture and more budget-driven decision-making processes is critical. As I mentioned, Leaf sampling alone has problems. It has problems because it was never designed. If you go back to the original literature, leaf tissue sampling and analysis was explicitly designed for finding deficiencies. No good grower manages their field at the margin of deficiency. All growers are managing in the range of sufficiency, and there is no relationship of any value between tissue values once you are in that sufficient range. And then you've always got to think about variability and what decision are you actually making? There are guidelines for all of this. Each country has uh, its guidelines for what, to, what a critical value is. But in order to use a critical value effectively, you need to recognize the context that it sits in. All right. <clears throat> With the movement towards budgetary uh, driven nutrient management, uh, this is the new guidelines that the Californian industry has put out uh, for representative orchards of different ages. This is the nitrogen demanded to grow the tree. It's greatest as that orchard fills out its space. So in years two, three, four, five, six, it then diminishes. You have a demand for the trees and in a average orchard, these are the sorts of rates. So this is what the University of uh, uh, Almond Industry has, has been doing in California. And they have a guideline that you can, you can Google this and pick it up. I've also produced a number of sort of simplified integrated uh, information that you guys can download as well. <clears throat> Let's talk about right place. The goal, of course, in management of any of our nutrients, if we're not to waste them, is to make sure they are present where the roots are present. So where are the roots present in an irrigated, fertigated almond orchard? We derived that by looking directly at the roots with this imaging system inserted into the soil. And you can use that to see when roots are formed. And you can see the initiation of roots at leaf out, great increase in root production through to June and July, and then new root production drops off and total root prevalence drops off. This is harvest here, 
and this is post-harvest. Noticed in contradiction to some of the textbooks that you may have seen, there is no great increase in root formation late in the year. The second year is much lower root production, probably because this first year's yield was so high. 4,600 pounds, six ton, that's a big, big yield. Compromised root growth in the subsequent year. Rooting depth. Most roots, most small active roots in almond occur in the top 30, 40 centimeters, top 18 inches. There are some roots at depth, but very few. We'll come across this treatment regime later on. This is continuous fertigation, where you're putting small amounts of nutrients in every single fertigation and irrigation event. This is pulsed fertigation. There are four fertigation events. You put larger amounts four times. When there's larger amounts four times, you tend to push the roots a little bit deeper in the profile. I'll show you why that's not necessarily a good thing in a moment. So where are roots? Roots grow where we put the water. Basically, that's where they are, particularly in the dry environments, Australia, Israel, Spain, California, where we don't get any, uh, any substantial summer rain. Um, roots grow where water is put. Now that's both an opportunity and a challenge. We can manipulate rooting depth. We can manipulate nutrient depth by how we fertigate. What we commonly see in California and what we also see in, in Australia, I'm certain, is that nutrients can accumulate at depth if they get pushed through the profile. We also see salts accumulating at depth. And I'm going to talk about that interaction between nutrients and salts in just a minute. See, I'm talking too long. All right, let's talk about right balance. I'm going to touch upon potassium briefly, and then we'll touch upon zinc. Using the same approach that I showed you for nitrogen budgetings, we've pr produced these curves for potassium. And in many regards, they look very similar. Very little uptake early in the season and a great increase in uptake as, as the season proceeds. A couple of small differences with potassium. Notice the total amount of potassium in this 12-year-old orchard is about 130 pounds accumulated over that, over that entire 12 years. So five to 10 pounds per year. The nitrogen is at 450. So whereas a tree demands from 20 to 55 pounds of nitrogen a year to grow, it only requires between three and 10 pounds of potassium to grow. So that's a big difference. There's much less reserves and there's much less early season dependence on reserves for potassium than nitrogen. Also, you can see uptake occurring for potassium a little bit earlier in the year than for nitrogen. No nitrogen uptake before mid-March, some potassium uptake in February. You also see late season, this big jump in potassium content of the fruit because most of the potassium is going into the hull, whereas most of the nitrogen is going into the kernel and the kernel is mature earlier than the hull. So there's some differences there some similarities, some subtle differences. Um, total nitrogen demand, total potassium demand for fruit is a bit higher than total nitrogen, but total nitrogen demand for growth is higher than total potassium demand. So they're fairly equal in their total annual demand. There are some questions that come when we think about potassium. It is expensive. Many growers find potassium their most expensive input. How are we using it? In the US, it's been historical to use sulfate of potash as a banded application. There are questions as to whether this is effective. I know in Australia and most of Europe, fertigation, Israel, fertigation is the predominant method. We've got some questions about in-season fertigation and some questions about the interrelationships between nitrogen and salinity, potassium and salinity. And I'm going to touch on those right now. In California, we use a very old fashioned approach quite widely, and that is banded SOP applications in the winter as a primary source of potassium. This was done because we've got fix, potassium fixing soils. And the premise was that this high concentration band saturates, saturates the fixation sites and gives a slow release characteristic to the, to the root. The problem is 
we've transitioned from flood and solid sprinkler application to drip application. And now much of this SOP band will sit outside the irrigated zone. Now, these are sprinklers in this case, but if you imagine drip lines down here, uh, you would have challenges to, uh, to uh, access this SOP. So we did some big experiments to investigate SOP, potassium nitrate, potassium chloride, potassium thiosulfate as potassium sources, and how the tree responds. Now, bear in mind, these are Californian conditions. This is an exquisitely nice alluvial um, loamy sand soil. It's a rich soil. We didn't have potassium deficiency. That's condition number one. Condition number two, we compared drip and fan jet. And I'll show you the results of some of the key aspects of this. So first, the treatments. So I've got seven treatments listed here to explain them. C means fertigation occurring in every irrigation event. F is the more traditional Californian method of fertigating four times out of the 20 irrigation events. SOP, KTS, potassium nitrate. Um, so that's how you read these different treatments. So as example, F375, 125 means fertigated four times, 75 pounds of, of potassium nitrate, 125 pounds of K coming from SOP. Only one significant beneficial effect. This here is the standard practice of um, <clears throat> fertil fertilization with SOP. This is application of potassium nitrate, but not 100% potassium nitrate, a mixture of 75 and 125. That resulted in a thousand pound benefit in yield over the three year period in comparison with the unfertilized control. Now there are some considerations here. 100% potassium nitrate did not have the same benefit. Potassium thiosulfate, a soluble, fertigated product, did not have the same benefit. There is something about that potassium nitrate as a proportion of in-season fertilization that made a difference here. We'll talk about the possibility in the next few slides. Now, this next is still somewhat hypothetical, but I think it both explains what's possibly going on um, and illustrates how management of your potassium and your nitrate, nitrogen interacts with management of salinity. This is a Monterey nonpareil orchard. The nonpareil orchard is showing tremendous salt burn, primarily because water was removed, salts were accumulated, salts were concentrated, and the plant uh, took up those salts. So here's the reality of what a drip or a micro-irrigated root zone looks like if you've got moderate salinity in the irrigation water. In this case, salinity of irrigation water about one decisimal. So by the time you reach the end of the season, you will have a zone of moderately low uh, salinity and a zone of high salinity at the margins of the wetted zone because you're pushing those salts through that profile. But you can also have this. And when we've monitored, monitored many of these drip zones in California, we find that a whole lot of the nitrogen is now co-located in that saline zone. That's understandable. Nitrate and chloride move through the soil with almost the same hydraulic conductivity. So if they're applied together, if they're not applied carefully, they will end up in the same zone. We have had a hypothesis from a lot of our observations that if you could prevent that nitrogen from entering this saline marginal zone, that you could prevent the roots from exploring this saline marginal zone. Now, we tested that using a split root system. So just to explain what the split root system looks like. So here's an almond plant. We've divided their roots into two halves, one half in treatment A, one half in treatment B. This was our attempt to replicate what's happening in the field. Obviously in the field, it's much more complex than this, but this is the way we can do it experimentally. And I wanna show you some really interesting results. So what we're measuring here is uptake of water. 
uptake of water from either side A or side B. So if you set these plants up with no salt and all the nutrients on one side and no nutrients on the other side and no salt, the plants will 100% explore the container that contains the nutrients. If, however, you put nutrients and salt together in one side and no nutrients in the other side, now the plant 100% explores the salty soil. Why? Because it's looking for the nutrients. What this means is if you can manage your irrigation and fertigation systems to allow the movement of the salt to the margins, but the retention of the nitrogen and the potassium in the sweet zone, you can prevent exploration of the salty soil. This may explain why small concentrations of potassium nitrate, a soluble nitrogen form in that root zone during the, the, the fertigation system provided the benefit that we saw in that particular field. But it certainly illustrates that we've got to be thinking much more carefully about how we manage the co-location of salts and nutrients. It also illustrates that if you do a banded SOP uh, program, that you've clearly put all your potassium at the margins of the wetted zone in the most highly saline zone. All right. Right source, let's talk a little bit about zinc. Um, I've got a little bit of time um, to talk, chat about this. So zinc deficiency is the number one micronutrient challenge in the US, in Almond. I think it is also in Australia in Almonds and Almonds and, and Spain and Portugal as well. What it does, of course, are these very characteristic symptoms of poor bud initiation, poor bud break, these little rosette clusters that you can see here as well. These symptoms indicate a role in bud development and bud uh, expansion. There's another effect of zinc that is a little bit more subtle. These are some trials, in this case it's plum, uh, with differential zinc applications, and the major symptom that was seen was weaker and more inconsistent flowering. Now, as a grower, this is difficult to see. I can see it here because I've got the contrast between the two treatments. If you didn't have the contrast, you wouldn't see it. You'd only say, well, flowering looks a bit weak this year. I talked about this critical piece of the phenology of the plant, the bud initiation and the bud development. And we had some questions related to zinc is when and how is this zinc, which is critical for this process, utilized and accumulated in the buds. And so we did some work at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. This is the facility where they do, you know, um, Department of Energy and Department of Defense research and physics experiments. But we can use it to look at the localization of zinc in developing buds. So here's a, a recent paper just published by our group in plant physiology. Buds of different age from dormancy in December through to expansion in March, early March, cross sections. And what we're looking at in this bottom diagram is the concentration of zinc in the different organs and the concentration of calcium. Red color is zinc, green color is calcium. This is a dormant bud that is loaded up with zinc, loaded up with calcium. As that bud starts to develop and open, the zinc is rapidly mobilized into the apical meristem. And then after a little while, new sources of zinc start to appear and start to come from uh, the, the, uh, the spur wood. This is a spur through here, uh, just in this phase of development. You can see the zinc concentrations, but you can also see the zinc starting to mobilize into that tissue. So zinc has to be laid down in those buds while those buds are being developing. And once it enters into the springtime, the zinc that has been stored is the zinc that's essential for that growth process. Take that zinc away and you get those zinc deficiency symptoms that you see here. Same with calcium. When was that laid down? Another experiment that was just published as well. These are buds in the nodes. This is a cartoon, but in the nodes of the shoot. 
So this is the most mature. This is the youngest. As you go from young to mature, you can see that zinc and that calcium being laid down in that bud. The critical process is occurring during active growth once those first bud initials form in May or June through to July, August, when that zinc then is laid down in the buds and subsequently used for growth. Boron is another essential element for the flowering process. We don't have much time to talk about that, uh, but it also must be present in those buds. It's a little different than zinc, is you can get some boron into those young buds after they are formed. Most important to get it while they're being formed, but you can uh, retroactively. That's why this period is something we've got to focus on in almond. We do not want to deprive it of essential elements of nitrogen, potassium. We do not want to deprive it of water and dry it down for harvest too hard because we're compromising these processes. <laughs> kind of summarized um, the life cycle of the almond tree and when we have to think about things. The period early in the year is primarily determined by remobilization of stored nutrients. There's not a lot you can do to manipulate this phase of almond growth. It all occurred previously. As you enter that rapid growth of the fruits, this is where your potassium and your nitrogen is in great demand. As you get into, into the period of bud development, fruit maturation is where you must pay particular attention to your micronutrients and calcium and boron because they're so essential for that flowering process. Obviously, potassium and nitrogen must then be available for remobilization into the buds, but this is mostly from nitrogen and potassium that's present in the leaves. You cannot, this is a little bit too late in the year to manipulate these values. Nitrogen and potassium has to be optimized here. So you can think about it as the critical timeframes for manipulating and monitoring and managing these nutrients as such. Now, I'm going to have to go back to my hosts. I've spent my whole hour and I haven't even got onto topic number two. So I think I will hold it here and you're going to have to invite me back for topic number two, which is about biostimulants uh, at another date. So I think we can take questions right there. I do have some, uh, as I said, I, I'll share this slide set with any of the attendees. I have a summary slide here of how we think about managing zinc uh, and also one about how we think about managing um, nitrogen. I mean, boron in this case. All right. Um, if my hosts agree, I'll stop here and we'll take questions. Okay. Um, one of the first questions we got is, what can you tell us about the use and effect of silicon on almonds? Nothing. Nothing. Next. No, you know, um, there's been very little work on silicon. I know in a lot of crops, uh, it's been implicated in fungal and disease control. Uh, so one might premise that hull rot diseases, uh, fungal diseases could be influenced by silicon, but I've not seen any, of, a, a, any rigorous scientific uh, experiments whatsoever. There are some commercial, you know, sales type experimentation, but I haven't seen rigorous. Gotcha. All right, and then how effective are fertilizers with technology as controlled release, slow release, and inhibitors uh, for nitrogen? So they are, they, they are all effective. Uh, they all serve the same purpose of maintaining that nitrogen in the root zone until the plant accesses it. One of the things I illustrated before is, you know, if you've got excess nitrogen in the soil, the plant will not utilize it. It will wait until the plant demand has caught up and then it will utilize it. Now, that's not a problem if you're not leaching the soil, but if you are irrigating, then that nitrogen sitting in the soil is, uh, is, is, uh, could be lost. It could be moved into that salty zone and then you could have the roots chasing it. What a, a, a controlled release or an enhanced efficiency uh, nitrogen form will do is hold it in the root zone for a longer period of time. Frankly, you could do exactly that with careful fertigation. You know, you don't need those expensive solutions if you've got the ability to spoon feed in accordance to demand. Gotcha. Um, the next one was right here. Any experiment experiment for differences between types of N, uh, types of nitrogen? 
Right. You know, I know there's been, uh, it, depending where you are, people have a preference for early season nitrate rich or early season ammonium rich. Um, I am not aware in almonds of any rigorous experimentation of differential nitrogen form. One of the premises of early ammonium application as a, as a preference is if the soils are very cold, if the soils are very wet, then you're not going to get nitrification occurring very rapidly or mineralization. So you, you, providing ammonium is theoretically more readily available. I don't know that that has ever been demonstrated. I also, if you remember back to when uptake starts to occur, you know, that first two, three weeks of bud development and flowering, nitrogen's not being taken up from the soil anyway. So frequently you don't have very cold, very wet soils once leaf out occurs. So I'm not sure that that rationale exists. I am aware many growers like to mix and match nitrate sources versus ammonium sources, but I am not aware of rigorous experimentation that says that's worthwhile. Um, so with cover, uh, about cover crops, do you think it supplies enough nitrogen was one of the questions or how much, maybe how much nitrogen do cover crops supply? Um, no, certainly it does not provide enough. Um, you know, a, a, a 4,000 pound, five ton almond crop requires 260, 300 units of nitrogen. The best cover crop in the world might provide 60 or 80. Um, and it frequently doesn't provide it at the right time of the year because as the, as you go through the summertime, the presence of cover crops would inhibit management practices and utilize water. And in the middle of summer, those are two things you can't, can't, can't compromise. So cover crops can be incredibly important for that early season stabilization, stabilization of nitrogen, very important for soil health characteristics, very important for early season supply, but they're never going to be sufficient for a whole season supply of a highly productive orchard. <clears throat> uh, for zinc, uh, what is the best timing for zinc applications? So um, foliar penetration of zinc is not very uh, effective once the leaf is mature and has hardened off. So early spring supplementation as those leaves are expanding works for foliar. Um, we found, you know, some of the higher priced materials that are listed here um, are more effective, but they're also way more expensive. So we've actually found that often you can get the same efficacy from a higher rate of zinc sulfate as you can from a lower rate of a expensive zinc chelate or zinc polyol or zinc sugar complex. The late season zinc uh, foliar is very difficult to get into the leaves. There was historically a characteristic in, in the US, uh, California, of putting very high concentrations of zinc at the end of the year to defoliate the trees on the premise that it also provides zinc to the trees. It doesn't. It doesn't work. All you are doing is spraying expensive foliar fertilizer on the leaf and it drops on the ground and becomes a very inefficient soil application. Soil applications, it depends on your constraints. Um, spoon feeding, Spoon feeding when the soil and manipulating the acidity a little bit, if you've got a highly alkaline soil, that can be very effective as well. The big issues with zinc are in those unique soils, high pH, high carbonate concentration, where there's a tremendous amount of zinc fixation. Then you're going to have to be very aggressive with your acidification programs. All right. So we hit a lot. I got one more question and then we'll wrap this up. So. Um, the state, this one is pertaining to California. The state of California has come a long way with the different water board regions and coalitions as far as groundwater nitrogen le leaching regulations. If mm -hmm. you had a crystal ball, what other nitrogens will be, or what other nutrients will be affected besides nitrogen in the years to come, in your opinion, with the, uh, with the groundwater regulations? You know, there's almost no other nutrient that, that can permeate into the groundwater. Nitrate's unique because it's got the negative charge. Um, in some, uh, in the Midwest, they worry also about phosphate, but that's mostly surface runoff. So phosphorus fertilizer getting into the irrigation furrows, getting into the drainage furrows and getting into the waterways. Um, that's obviously not relevant for California. There's, there's no real offsite movement of phosphorus from almond orchards. So I think nitrate's the only one. 
Uh, what I would caution is, you know, I showed you the, the, the challenges with variability within the field. Now we've reached a level of nitrogen efficiency. Our best growers can reach 75% nutrient use efficiency, which is extraordinary. It's better than any other cropping system on earth, but it's not good enough because 25% of a 300 pound application is too much nitrogen to leach into the environment that exceeds groundwater loading limits. So if we're gonna go from the 75% to the 85% that will be required, we are going to have to be more precise, certainly cultivar specific uh, fertilization and probably zonal specific fertilization. That's what's coming next. So if I was an almond, almond grower about to put in a new irrigation system, I would be certain that you have the capacity to be site specific and subzone that fertile irrigation system when you put it in, because it's not easy to do it after you put it in. All right, well, thank you. And we appreciate it. We appreciate your time to come talk to us with almonds and all that your insight into everything. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for participating and um, have a good day. Thank you. I can hang around for a few minutes if anybody wants a few more questions. <laughs>